Well, good morning, all. Sorry, Dave, I got to push this down a bit. <laughs> uh, just one thing I wanted to share before we get into the message. Um, we are going to be um, spending some time in prayer corporately between Easter and Pentecost, uh, Easter Sunday and Pentecost Sunday. Uh, we're going to be gathering here together, and uh, I, I didn't get it into the bulletin yet, but I will have more details for you next week on that. So just, just keep that in mind, that uh, we, uh, through those seven weeks, want to be praying together. So uh, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 42. We're going to read the first four verses. Isaiah chapter 42, it's also going to be up on the screen for us, starting at verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, The islands will put their hope. May God bless the reading of His Word this morning. Mark Everly uh, shares this story. He says, On my trip to Ireland, we visited Northern Ireland, uh, including a city called Londonderry. this was, something, this was something because of the violence that tours would not have done 10 years ago, at the time of his writing this. The name of the town is significant because it became a symbol of people being marginalized. Aristocrats from England wanted to rename the town from Derry to Londonderry. Uh, they, of course, were Protestants. Native Roman Catholics wanted simply Derry but they were powerless to do so. The media has portrayed the conflict in Northern Ireland to be a matter of religion, Protestant versus Catholic. However, there was much more to it than religious beliefs. Yes, the division was along these religious lines, but the factors behind them had more to do with economics and political power than religious ideals. It was about justice. A law was created by the elite that would not allow Roman Catholics to own land. This obviously puts a financial burden on a certain group of people, but what else does that lack of land ownership do? It prevents one from voting. Therefore, who stays in office and holds the power? The Protestants. At at heart of the issue, the Roman Catholics wanted to join the rest of Ireland, because they saw the British or or Unionists as being oppressive. Desiring an end to oppression and being treated justly is not a sinful, envious desire. Since the Belfast Agreement that basically allowed for equal economic rights and the sharing of power, violence has all but disappeared. Tensions still exist, but the emerging... Uh, the emerging generations are less and less concerned with the wars of their fathers and are instead focused on making the most of economic opportunity. Well, we continue our look at these traits um, that God wants to develop in us as we head towards the cross. We do live in a world that recognizes the need for justice. We have seen all over the world a a cry for justice. 
Different groups across the U.S. have have protested over perceived injustices, whether it was uh, pro-abortion groups protesting the Supreme Court or minority groups protesting over the death of a black man at the hands of the police. We saw truckers and supporters protesting over uh, what was perceived as forced immunization. We also have people protesting and people fighting the injustice of Russia invading the Ukraine. The world has some sense of what injustice looks like. The difficulty, if we look for a strictly human answer, um, is that we, uh, sorry, the difficulty if we look for a strictly human answer to the problem of injustice is that we humans are flawed in our understanding and humans, of course, can have different definitions of what justice looks like. The Israelites knew what it was to seek justice from God. King Solomon, in his dedication prayer for the temple, prayed this. He said, when anyone wrongs their neighbor and is required to take an oath, and they come and swear the oath before your altar in this temple, then hear from heaven and act. Judge between your servants, condemning the guilty by bringing down on their heads what they have done and vindicating the innocent by treating them in accordance with their innocence. 1 Kings 8, 31-32. In both the book of Romans and Hebrews, we're reminded what God told His people in the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy. It is mine to avenge. I will repay. God speaking there. God will be our avenger. Justice is inherent, in, inherent to His character. Righteous and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Psalm 89, 14. Our passage this morning speaks to someone who's called God's servant or the servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord is spoken of in, in four songs. Isaiah 42, 1-9. Isaiah 49, 1-13. Isaiah 50, verses 4-11. And then chapter 52, verse 13 to 53, verse 12. The servant of the Lord is God's faithful and true witness to humanity. It is thought that these verses are prophetic visions of the Messiah. And in Matthew's Gospel, he claims that these verses point to Jesus in Matthew 12, 18-21. Chapter 42 is our introduction to the servant and we're given a glimpse into his character. So let's take a look at what we can learn about the servant from this passage this morning. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. After chronicling the failure of Israel, God introduces us to his servant. And God says that he affirms him, or confirms him, I should say. When someone is the servant of another, the, the servant is required to give full service and obedience to his master. But the master is also required to take care of his servant. He also makes it clear that he has chosen him to be his servant. There's nothing random about how God works. We see how God chooses individuals to further his plans throughout the Bible. At Jesus' transfiguration, God the Father says, This is my Son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Luke 9.35 and Peter, in his first letter, says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. 1 Peter 2.9 When we are chosen, we are given a, a role to fulfill, but even so, we must in turn choose to fulfill it. And whereas God is disappointed with Israel, He makes it clear that He approves of and is happy with his servant. 
He is so happy with His servant that His Spirit rests on Him. When Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, Matthew tells us, as soon as Jesus was baptized, He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on Him. Matthew 3.16 Just as God breathed life into Adam, He breathed new life into His servant and Son, Jesus Christ. God's servant will bring justice to the nations. He tells His people that it won't just be Israel that benefits from the ministry of God's servant. It will be all people groups. In other words, not only the Jews, but the Gentiles too. Even though Jesus mainly ministered within Israel, During his three years, the Apostle John said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Jesus, the servant, is going to make things right for all. And Isaiah tells us how the people are crying out for justice. So justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. God's people were in exile, and they were looking for hope. They were looking for answers. The word just uh, is often translated as the word righteous. To be just is to keep righteousness. Justice is the maintenance of righteousness. If you interchange just and righteous, then as Paul says to the Galatians, the righteous or the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3.11 Paul also told the Romans, do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness or injustice, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness or justice. Romans 6.13 Paul makes it clear that faith is the key to living a just life. Faith builds righteousness in us, and faith in Christ is the solution. One One of the key difficulties in finding justice is the skewed understanding of truth. In the Western world, truth has been made completely subjective. Truth has somehow become based on individual interpretation. My truth is not the same as your truth. I mean, you've probably heard stuff like that. Or you live by your truth and I'll live by my truth. But God makes truth clear to us through the study of His Word. Uh, Dr. Bernard Nathanson was a leading abortion doctor in the United States in the 1970s. He had actually performed an abortion on a woman he had gotten pregnant during this time. This physician had campaigned vigorously for the legalization of abortion, and and he states that he had performed over 75,000 abortions himself. But something changed Dr. Nathanson's point of view the introduction of the ultrasound in 1976. The device literally opened a window on fetal development. The first time Dr. Nathanson saw an ultrasound in action, he was convicted. He could see a a throbbing heart and all four chambers of the heart pumping blood. He said that his mind had, had dropped the word fetus in favor of the word baby. And suddenly everything he had been learning about the child in the womb since his entry into medicine snapped into focus. He had known what took place in the womb, but seeing it for the first time changed everything. Dr. Nathanson, the the leading abortion doctor in America, became convinced that the human life existed within the womb from the onset of pregnancy. In an article that he wrote for the New England Journal of Medicine, he wrote, an abortion were taking life. After deciding 
that abortion was murder, he switched camps and began to campaign for a reversal of Roe versus Wade. He ended up converting to Catholicism in 1996 and passed away in 2011. Just like the ultrasound brought light to him, the Word of God brings light to us. Jesus Himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. John 14.6 We discover how to love and what is truth and what righteousness looks like through our own personal study of the Bible. Works even better when we come together as groups and, and help one another, sharpen one another with what the Word of God says. Theologian Eric Vogelin, talking about St. Augustine's theology of justice, said this, Thus the love of God is the fountain from which justice flows, for it is only in the love of God manifested in the love of others from which justice can assign to each his due. And we only truly understand the love of God uh, more strongly when we study His Word, when we study the Bible. All of us, all of humanity, not just the Jews, have the opportunity to find faith and to live justly through what God has to say to us in the Bible. What's important to note here, though, is that God's justice through Jesus, the servant, does not come down like a hammer. Look at the rest of our passage in Isaiah 42 there. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, He will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till He establishes justice on earth. In His teaching, the islands will put their hope. Justice comes forth by way of peace, not war. It comes out of weakness, not strength. For us, it feels like it's backwards. I mean, look, look at Jesus. Look at His character. Look at how he, the, the, uh, the Gospels write of Him. Jesus didn't yell at people. I mean, yes, there were some loud interactions at times. That I, I'm not going to deny that. But His way of bringing the truth of God to others was not done by attacking. It, it was done through through quiet conversations and questions that he would, he would ask. It was done through teaching on a mountainside or in the temple or even in the synagogue. He doesn't break the already bent reed and he, he does I'm not doing anything. Sorry. Um, uh, he doesn't put out the flickering candle. Christ, Christ didn't win arguments by, by domineering over people. He, he disarmed his opponents through love and grace and a gentle demeanor. And, and because of that, the islands, or, or in other words, the nations have put their hope in Him. Christ's name is declared all around the world, not just in Israel. David Pryor wrote, justice and kindness are essential qualities of the nature of God Himself. They do not come down from heaven wrapped in parcels. They are expressed in and through people who walk humbly with God. And we only learn how to walk humbly through God, through the life of Christ, through Jesus, the servant. Now, it's hard for many to accept that 
justice was served through Christ dying on the cross. But a penalty had to be paid for our sin. There was no way around it. And Christ sacrificed Himself to pay it for us. For all of us. Scottish theologian Alexander White said, speaking about the cross, it's the picture of violence, yet the key of peace, or key to peace. It's a picture of suffering, yet the key to healing. It's a picture of utter weakness, yet the key to power. It's a picture of capital punishment, yet the key to mercy and forgiveness. It is a picture of supreme shame, yet the Christian's supreme boast. It's a picture of death, yet the key to life. It is a picture of the vicious hatred, yet the key to love. Justice is backwards in the kingdom of God. If we want justice, we must be willing to sacrifice instead of hoard. If we want justice, we must be gentle instead of domineering. If we want justice, we must be gracious instead of demeaning. If we want justice, we we protect the disenfranchised instead of the wealthy. If we want justice, we speak with kindness instead of hatred. And if we want justice, we live for Christ instead of the world. The cross may have appeared unjust, but it was the only way justice could be served. Served for us. Served for a broken and sinful humanity. We're only a couple of weeks away from remembering the cross, really. Remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. And as we're heading in that direction, um, let's remember God's call to be a just people in His name. And I, I know full well as I mentioned earlier, there there is a cry for justice in our society, in our world. But we have the opportunity as God's people to see true justice done in His name. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank You uh, for this morning. We thank You for Um, this picture of the servant of God. This picture really of Jesus. This prophetic picture that was made hundreds of years before Jesus appeared on the scene. And Lord God, as human beings, we do cry out for justice. Our world cries out for justice And yet, when we think of it in human perspectives, we we get lost in what justice should look like. And Lord, You made it clear that Your justice is different than the world's justice. Many do not understand why Jesus had to die. And yet He had to pay that penalty for my sin, for our sin, for the world's sin. And Lord God, I I pray that I pray that the body of Christ will be seen as a more just people. That Your righteousness, Your justice will shine through us. That we can point to Jesus and say, Here's what justice looks like. Here's what a just world can look like. 
here is what it means to be a good and just people in our world. So Lord, I, I, I do pray. I do pray that justice will be done in those unjust places, in those unjust circumstances. And yet you've made it clear, God, that we have to be the examples of justice. We have to point others to the God of justice. And so help us, I pray. Give us courage and strength to stand up for the disenfranchised, to, to stand against uh, crimes, against humanity, to stand for truth and to point others to what truth truly is found in You, found through You, found in Jesus. Continue to be with us here this morning, Lord, as we continue in our worship. And Lord, forgive us for those times where we have not sought You as the God of justice and help us, help us understand what it means to be a just person in this, in this world. I pray now in Jesus' name. Amen.